Julius, um, I hear people giving me very conflicting stories about liquid cooling and its potential. You know, on, in, on a given day, one guy will tell me that liquid cooling is inevitable and all servers will have to be liquid cooled within another 10, 20 years. And someone else will say, uh, the tide is turning, power densities will never reach the level where liquid cooling is needed. Which is true? Well, they're both true in the sense of there is a great deal of discontinuity between the two camps, the air-cooled camp and the liquid-cooled camp. And the truth is that I think both will coexist. The reality is right now, liquid cooling is a very, very small percentage of the market, if you want to look at it that way. At the moment, what's driving liquid cooling is high-performance computing. So a lot of the high-performance computing platforms are based on one form or the other liquid cooling. There is greater and greater interest of it because of the efficiency aspect. Energy efficiency on all liquid cooling is substantially higher than air-cooled equipment. And the density question does come into play because you're right, air cooling has sort of reached that commodity limit of five, six, seven kilowatts and you can pick a number that you want. But those people that are looking for higher and higher performance levels are beginning to consider liquid cooling. More interestingly, you have the mainstream vendors like HP and IBM who have always had some form of liquid cooling product, but it's always been a specialty product. Uh, now that the tide has turned into the fact that you can convert air-cooled servers into liquid-cooled servers, uh, a lot of third-party vendors are converting branded servers into complete systems. And I think that percentage will become significant within the next three years. Green Grid, for instance, has formed a uh, liquid cooling committee to define the different type of liquid cooling to avoid this marketing confusion because there are a lot of myths and misunderstandings out there. And I happen to be on the committee for the Liquid Cooling Technology Update Committee. And we're in the process of producing a white paper. We've got all the major vendors in there, the chip manufacturers are involved. So they have a good reason to do it because from a technology point of view, it's both economical and higher performance. And ultimately, it gives us the opportunity for long-term energy recovery. One of the things you can't really do readily with air cooling is do energy recovery. So even when we get to that miracle PE of 1.01 or whatever our lowest possible number is, we're still, every megawatt in is being turned into heat and disposed of. Whether it's air cooled or dumped into the sea, our PUE is one, that means that one megawatt, 100 megawatts are all being uh, heating the planet. With liquid cooling, we have the opportunity for energy reuse, which is the big picture answer to taking those megawatts and making them reused heating water, a building facility water, or other uh, heat-related processes that we can uh, do energy recovery. So all of a sudden, instead of wasting a megawatt, maybe we recover seven or 800 kilowatts out of that megawatt, and it changes the TCO number. And TCO is driving the bits business. Every click turns into a financial transaction, and if we can lower the price of clicks through technology, through cooling technology, uh, greater IT performance, which is one of the HPC advantages of liquid cooling, then I think ultimately that will cause the economics to change the equation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.